I'd like to uh, welcome now Paulina uh, Tiplakova from Russia. She's a radical feminist and editorial member of lesbian political magazine Vestnitsa, Vestnitsa in Russia. And um, uh, Paulina, could you tell us a little bit about the situation in Russia uh, for lesbians? We are a little behind other countries right now because we're here in Russia, we are more conservative, uh, opposite to you know, patriarchal you know, politics that is happening now is Europe in US. I wouldn't say that our lesbian community is small here, but everyone here knows each other, at least through someone, especially you know, locally in the cities. We don't really have women only spaces to hang out. We have something like, uh, you know, in my city, GBT resource center, but it's open to trans, trans lesbians, uh, you know, and uh, men, so it's not really, you know, safe. And some bars, as far as I know, do have some lesbian parties on certain days, but, but most of the times uh, there are often so-called drag queens on the stage performing and there is not really a barriers from men and things like that. So the safest and most popular place to meet for Russian lesbians is just our flats. It's, it's just our homes, just our flats or sometimes you no know, parks, but mostly just, just our flats. How did you find other lesbians? Like, and how did you start to meet people? I decided to become a lesbian when I first learned about radical feminism. It was almost five years ago. I was 16 at the time. And I just came on one of the meetings of just, you know, random people talking about books. It wasn't, you know, feminist thing. And there was, uh, you know, women lesbians who actually were starting to you know, get into radical feminism. And I learned from them. And so we, for some time, uh, just gathered at their place uh, with other women who were interested from our circles, uh, you know, our, our circles of friends or people or women we know. And uh, that's, that's how I first, I, I think, met lesbians. <laughs> there was also, some kind of uh, lesbian community I was in. So when I was in my teenage years, uh, there were just, you know, young women like me who were mo mostly lesbians, but that's, that's mostly it. In groups, do you, uh, do you find that the gender identity politics is uh, aggressive or negative towards lesbians? Do, do you get men who are saying you should go out with um uh with them and they're saying or or is it do they leave you alone and we are not really you know visible in our country and we are just doing this mostly in our flats or online so we don't really i haven't really you know met aggressive men who were saying to me well i i met my dad who said <laughs> something like that but it's a little different if we're talking about the place uh, the Russian feminism right now, we are mostly online. We are mostly connecting via, you know, Twitter and our local Facebook, uh, you know, something like Facebook, but it's Russian network. So from, you know, with feminists and lesbians from other cities and, uh, you know, there were there were cases, and I think they are going to repeat that this Russian network we are mostly all connected in, they, for example, deleted some uh, feminist groups, especially uh, some groups that were openly, you know, talking about radical feminism, about political lesbianism. I remember that that happened. There is also, you know, some kind of censorship there's, uh, you know, some group online that I'm, you know, that I read their posts. And once there were, there was some post that was radical, you know, not exactly, not exactly 
you know, it was talking good about men, so it got deleted by, you know, the administration of that network. So this is what happening. And of course, if you say something controversial on, you know, Russian side of Twitter, it's going to blow up and the men, of course, uh, are going to go there and tell you so many bad things, you know, uh, this happens. You're working on issues to do with women's culture and lesbian visibility in art. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I actually um, have already brought up this topic in one of the online publications uh, in, you know, Lesbian Political Magazine Investing, so that I'm a part of. And uh, I actually, this topic is important for me, partly because, you know, who doesn't like, you know, listen to good music and to read, you know, good books and something like that. And I have many amazing friends who are lesbians, who are radical feminists, who are doing, you know, this job with are do doing, you know, art for women. And I myself, you know, writing some songs, at least trying, so I can, you know, make something, make it bigger. So I think I'm gonna talk about, you know, my, my topic. And I want to start with losses. Because in the discussion of political lesbianism, there is a certain tendency to focus on losses, to focus on things that we supposedly have to give up when we take on the path of resistance to male power. And cultural separatism, as far as I heard from other women, is considered one of the hardest things to do compared to other things to separatism if we don't count, you know, going to the woods and living with other women that's, that's one of the hardest to, you know, give up the patriarchal culture. And I've heard so many women regretfully recall films and books and music that due to their political choices, they can no longer enjoy the way they used to. Art created by men and women identified with men is seen as a vital and irreplaceable part of life. So where where is the basis of this so-called emotional and aesthetic pleasure that is so impossible and unbearable for women to give up? And women describe their experiences with male culture as an opportunity to relax, to experience joy and comfort. This pleasure is rooted in the woman's realization that when she consumes the products of male culture, she demonstrates the correct heterosexual behavior she is once again reminded of where her place really is in the system of male supremacy. She is humiliated in her attempts to find consolation. The culture of the dominant class becomes the last bastion of her entertainment. As a pleasure, it's not what it seems. It's not a rest from a difficult female existence. It's not a restoration of emotional resources. It's nothing more than just a feeling of relief from escaping the imaginary punishment for a thought crime against male power. Slaves shouldn't have their own culture because its existence leads to the develop development of group consciousness. And men understand that very well. So it's important for them to keep women separated from each other and alienated from themselves and their feelings. The widespread myth of romantic love successfully handles this task which among other instruments of male power is actively being implemented into the female consciousness with the help of art and culture. And regardless of the skill of the author, you know, the depth of the general message, the presence of female characters, such work cannot be considered female representation and therefore has no value in women's eyes since it's not intended for women Men write songs and shoot films exclusively for other men. All art created within the framework of the patriarchal paradigm is actually a retelling of political propaganda that promotes the institution of heterosexuality and male values. A man's idea of what a woman should be like, what feelings she is allowed to experience and what thoughts to have. 
Women gain nothing by devoting their time and their thoughts to men. Admiring overvalued art, broadcasting male ideology, and contributing to patriarchal culture. Heterosexual behavior destroys the female consciousness, prevents the development of female group consciousness, and makes the existence system stronger. Women identification is a source of strength. If a woman is deprived of it and wastes her resources of men, she loses herself and loses contact with other women. Yes, indeed, the prospect of cultural deprivation seems to be a terrifying fate, but the truth is that male culture has never belonged to women, which means that its abandonment does not mean the loss of something truly important and dear to a woman's heart. We have nothing to lose because we don't have anything in male culture for us to begin with, and this should be a motivation for creators to make art from women, for women, and about women. Like, you know, Alex Dobkin said, <laughs> the works that will not become the retelling of male propaganda chest in girl power, but will contribute to women's culture. And also for contemplators to support the creators of such works. Women don't lose anything when they choose political lesbianism. The refusal to engage in heterosexual behavior is a step beyond the line of despiance, but the slip of faith doesn't end on a lonely and empty road. Beyond the line of disobedience, there is life. And this is the only thing that can be even called life for women in a world where everything and especially culture is permitted with the ideology of male dominance. No woman can claim that she is not a lesbian. When women say that they are not lesbians, they overlook the fact that the image of lesbian self in male culture is created with the participation of men and adjusted to the vision to lesbianism. Then who are lesbians if they are not the ones shown in movies? How can we be lesbians if we don't have access to lesbian culture? The visibility of lesbians is also the visibility of their culture. Lesbianism is not about lesbian sexual relationships. It's an emotional, intellectual, and creative connection between women. Any activity, emotional, intellectual, and creative, needs support. And therefore, the real act of lesbianism is to support women's art, women's music, and women's intellectual activities. This is the only way we can achieve what we call lesbian visibility. And we can't rely on men and wait for their help in this matter. Men can't be our allies in issue of lesbian vis visibility. Only we ourselves, by making a political choice of focusing our resources on women, can influence and enhance lesbian visibility. Our visibility. I want to, uh, you know, dedicate my speech and to her because. She was honestly such an inspiration and her music is still out there. And I think she will continue to be an inspiration for generations of lesbians to come because she did many amazing things and she did many things to you know, enhance this lesbian visibility we want. 